I'm going to, I think the cameraman said it way too easy. He just had to sit there and watch, point that thing at the stage, so I'm going to move around a bit. Um, thank you to Kim and Greg and everybody for asking me to speak today, but I'm not sure I want to say thank you for my topic. Um, I don't feel like Captain Kirk, William. I feel like the guy in the red shirt that always goes on the away mission with Captain Kirk, because they always die, right? And uh, so this is a, this is a, difficult topic and, and I struggled with this presentation quite a bit, mainly because it's a huge topic and, and you could go all sorts of different directions with it. So, uh, and the second part is that a lot of the research in it is old. There's not a lot of new research in this. A lot of this stuff happened in the 70s and 80s uh, and nobody's really repeated a lot of it since then. So, so it's kind of old news, so maybe that's why I'm up here. I've got enough gray hair, and Jansen probably couldn't come here today, so I probably got stuck with it because of him. Um, so we're in a unique industry. Of all the livestock industries, we're the only one that's really segmented significantly. The swine industry is a little bit, but it's so vertically integrated, it doesn't really matter. They have control over the product from day one right through to finish. And so we're the, we're the only industry, livestock industry, I think, uh, of any significant size that has, has this sort of segmentation issue. So we have the cow-calf, and I'm simplifying it, I've just got cow-calf producers and feedlots, right? We've got stalkers and backgrounders and stuff in between, but for now, let's just leave the intermediate guys out of it because that just muddies the water even more. So we got 65, I don't know how many it is, that was the 2011 census, 67,000, we're probably a little less than that cow-calf operations in Canada, and we got about 2,775 feeding operations in Canada according to the 2011 census. And all the cattle, or the vast majority of the cattle from these operations end up on these operations eventually, one way or the other. In fact, it's even more concentrated than that, the pyramid is even tighter is there's really 850 operations in Western Canada that feed 75% of the cattle. And if you really looked at that, about if there's probably 200 operations that feed 80% of that 75%. So it's this pyramid, inverted pyramid, right? We've got like two packers. We've got maybe 200 big feedlots that feed the vast majority of the cattle. And then we've got 65,000 cow calf operations. All right. And the cow-calf operations are mostly small. So in this room, we probably got lots of real producers with lots of cows and stuff, but there's an awful lot of producers with 30 cows and 40 cows and 50 cows and 10 cows like Dr. Stuckey over here, right? So there's lots, lots of small operations. What's the average herd size now in Canada? I don't even know, 56 or something like that? Or is it a bit higher now? Is it in the 70s now? Uh, so it probably depends who they count and how they count. But anyway, it's not very big. So there's lots and lots of small cow-calf herds. And there's actually smaller and smaller numbers of these large of feedlots that actually feed the calves. And when I started thinking about it, the cross-sector practices, there's really not too many practices that go back from the feedlot to the cow-calf guy. The only thing that goes back is money, right? And the only thing that goes around to the feedlot is sort of cattle, calves and yearlings and other classes of cattle. So, so we got this fairly simple relationship, we think. However, when I got thinking about it, probably the most important cross-sector practice, and I'm not going to talk about it today, is probably the genetics that gets sent forward. And I was at a talk, our Western Canadian Bovine Practitioners just had a talk, we had uh, uh, Annabelle uh, Van Eeninum, can't never say her name, from um, Allison Van Eeninum, sorry, from uh, University of California Davis, famous livestock geneticist, did, some, did a great talk on sort of genetics and feed efficiency and now even disease resistance. We have these 800,000 chip SNPs now that we can do on cattle. I mean, it's the wave of the future. There's gonna be some amazing developments in terms of genomics, both in terms of sort of efficiency and productivity, but even in terms of disease resistance and things like that. I'm not gonna talk about genetics in this one, but I think that's one of the ways of the future, but the trouble with that wave just like all the other cross-sector practices, is that the cow-calf producer has to get paid appropriately for figuring out which are the better genetics and making sure those better genetics get there. And they gotta get the data from the feedlot to be able to make those decisions, which is not an easy task, right? Those sort of little details about moving data back and forth between these segments are huge issues. 
And so that'll be an important thing in the future, but it, it, it's not something I'm going to talk about here. I'm going to focus mostly on, on disease. Then I got thinking about it, well, there is one more thing that goes back and forth between the two, the two sectors, and that's basically criticism and complaints. And so there's lots of that cross-sector stuff going back and forth, and so I think I'm done there, I'll just quit. Um, because there is lots of that going on. However, we're all in the same industry. Uh, we do have some big picture things that we've got to look at, and I want to look at mostly disease uh, from a veterinarian's perspective and cross-sector practices that affect disease. And the disease that I want to look at is bovine respiratory disease, which has a million different names. We call it undifferentiated bovine respiratory disease and shipping fever and fibrinous pneumonia if you're a pathologist and undifferentiated fever if you're from feedlot health or whatever. There's lots of different names for it. But it's this syndrome that's probably the most studied disease of cattle by far. There's more research papers on respiratory disease than any other disease of cattle. We study it to death. And if you look at where all the money is, right? The pharmaceutical companies, all the antibiotics they market, what are they licensed for? They're licensed for respiratory disease because it's such a big problem, right? All our vaccine, vast majority of our vaccines, what are they licensed for? They're licensed for respiratory disease. It's such a huge problem. Everybody is paying attention to it. It's a huge problem. And I hate these statistics because I don't know how they make them up, but anyway, they say it costs a lot of money in the US to deal with respiratory disease and feedlots. I believe it, right? We spend lots of money in our own feedlots uh, to deal with respiratory disease. So it's a big problem and, and it can account for a significant number of the treatments we do and a significant number of the mortalities. And as pressure comes on our industry, as it will in all the livestock industries, on how we use antimicrobials, and believe me, that pressure is coming. I don't know when it will happen, but there will be more and more pressure about how we use antimicrobials in the, in the, in the livestock industries we may have to do some things differently because we may not be able to just sort of sit blanket everything with, with liquid health, as William called it, and, and uh, be able to deal with our problems that way. We may have to do some other things down the road. Uh, we're not there yet, and I think we're a long ways from that, uh, and thank goodness we are, but, uh, but we may need to think about that in the future. So, Respiratory disease, just a little bit about it. It's a disease of recently weaned calves, most of you know that. And morbidity, mortality, it's really highly dependent on lots of different risk factors, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But the first thing you gotta remember is the peak incidence of the disease is in the first three weeks of the feeding period. It happens really, really early in the feeding period. These animals aren't getting sick from respiratory disease, in most cases, two months after they've been on feed. They're getting sick shortly after they arrive. In fact, some of them are probably incubating disease when they arrive at the feedlot. So it happens early, early in the feeding period. And so it's consistently associated with arrival. In fact, 75% of the calves that go on to die from respiratory disease were sick in the first two weeks. And probably most of those were sick in the first five to seven days. So they get sick early, and the ones that get sick the earliest tend to die more often. In Saskatchewan and Alberta, we wean 80% of our wean calves in October and November. So we got this huge cluster of cattle moving, this huge movement from, from our 65,000 cow-calf operations in Canada to our three or 400 big feedlots. That's all happening in a, mostly in a two or three month period, right? Got spread out maybe a little bit now with some later calving herds, but not a whole lot. It's still vastly majority marketed there. And the disease clusters within groups. We'll see much higher rates of disease in certain pens and certain truckloads, largely because of a number of risk factors. So this is Dr. Jansen's slide, and he used to talk about, well, you know, if you were an alien and you came to Earth, and you saw these calves out in the open range, nice and healthy, and they come to the feedlot and they start eating out of the trough, and then they start dying, you might think you put poison in the trough, right? Because they're dying in the first few weeks of the feed yard. But it's nothing to do with the... With, uh, with the feed, but it would almost appear that way that, that this disease is happening fairly early uh, in the feeding period. So this is the slide I use with my vet students and I give them, when I'm introducing respiratory disease to them, and I give them all the risk factors of respiratory disease, and there's a huge long list. This is a syndrome, this is not one bug causes one disease, right? We have all sorts of viruses, all sorts of bacteria that are involved, so it's kind of a syndrome, it's not one specific disease. 
but there's all sorts of things that affect it. So, and most of you could probably make this list if I asked you to. You could probably come up with a lot of these things. My number one is weaning. This is a disease of freshly weaned calves. If we buy yearlings, we don't deal with respiratory disease nearly to the extent that we do with freshly weaned calves. So it really should be called weaning fever, not shipping fever. All right? It's a disease of weaning. And, and yeah, shipping plays a role and transportation plays a role, but it's probably not as important as we think it is. So it's a disease, disease of weaned calves. Certainly the risk increases the smaller the calf and the lighter the weight, the earlier they're weaned. Source of the animals, and I'll show you some, some data on that, ranch versus sales barns. Mixing is a big factor. So how many other sources of calves are they exposed to? Gender. Males are usually more susceptible to all sorts of infectious diseases than females, and that's not just cattle. That's, that happens in people and lots of other things. Males are much more likely to get pneumonia in people than females are. It's the very same in cattle. We can show uh, the same preponderance of males getting sick compared to heifers uh, in, in cattle as well. Transportation and then immunity. We're going to talk about some more of these in detail. Other things. Risk, fa risk factors, uh, when they're castrated and dehorned, like Reynolds talked about earlier today, uh, the size of the population, so how big is the feedlot? As the feedlot gets bigger, there seems to be a little bit more risk as the resident population increases. There's environmental stressors and there's probably a bunch of nutritional issues too. So a big long list, lots of risk factors, can't talk about them all in half an hour. So I'm going to talk about five cross-sector practices, and the last one is kind of a summary of, of a number of them. I want to talk about the ranch versus the sale barn a little bit, and just show you the differences in that. I want to talk about weaning, uh, castration, dehorning, focus mostly on immunity, but also talk a little bit about preconditioning at the end. So this is an old slide. This is from Andrew Kelly. Uh, it was in 1884, it was 1984, so <laughs> it's another old slide. But Andrew was an uh, Australian grad student that worked with Dr. Jansen at the Vet College. And he did a very simple thing. He graphed the epidemic curve. And I'm sure I need to go to Feedlot Health or to Nathan's old practice and, and get a more modern version of this. Uh, but they did a very simple thing. Andrew compared ranch calves versus sale barn calves. So the sale barn calves are in black and the ranch calves are the dotted line. And it's just the treatment rate. When did they get sick? When did they get treated over the time period? And you can see the ranch calves, a lot more of them got sick. The peak is a lot higher, right? And, or the auction market calves. So more mixing probably, exposed to more bugs, more viruses, maybe more stress. Uh, and so they get sick earlier and they get sick more often. But the ranch calves still got sick, right? They just tended to get sick a little bit later uh, maybe not quite as many of them, it maybe dragged on almost as long, but, but they still got sick. They didn't completely eliminate respiratory disease simply by coming directly from the ranch. So, eh, we could say let's blow up all the auction markets in Western Canada. I don't think that would be a very good idea. One thing is we need a method of price discovery to go from 67,000 farms to 300 farms. There's no other way to do it. How else are you going to do it? There's no other way. Sure, we can do some direct auctions, we can develop some relationships with, with larger cow-calf operations, and those are great. Those are you know, niche opportunities that we've got to take advantage of, but we're never going to be able to get away from the auction system. It's probably a fact of life, right? We just can't completely eliminate it. Well, so I've already mentioned that I think shipping fever should be called weaning fever, because it's a disease of weaned calves. And, and Timing relative, there's two sort of factors to weaning. One is the timing you come to the feedlot according to when you were weaned. So if you go to a Cinnaboya or wherever in Saskatchewan in the fall of the year and you get a hotel room there, you'll, get, you'll listen to baby calves bawling all night, right, in the fall of the year because most of those calves got weaned, stuck on the truck, and sent to the auction market. Right? The vast majority of them. And you can hear them all through town in, in October and November because they're there and they're, they're heading to feedlots. That's probably the highest risk. Right? You're weaned, you got this huge stressor, you're releasing corticosteroids into your system because it's a huge stress, you're looking for your mother, right? 
You don't know where you are. You're maybe thrown in with a bunch of other calves in a pre-sort sale you never met before. So you're trying to establish a dominance hierarchy or something like that. There's all these stressors. Your cortisol levels go through the roof. And when your cortisol level goes through the roof, your immune system crashes, right? So it's not terribly surprising that if you put weaning right next to when you're going to put them in the feedlot, we get lots of problems. So it'd be nice to separate that stressor and not have it right next door to this sort of other stressor of coming into a feedlot and, and, and dealing with all those other issues that happen there. The second one is not quite as easy to identify, but the method of weaning probably makes a difference. So we know we have some, uh, Dr. Stuckey's done lots of research on two-stage weaning and fence line weaning, and there's research from all over the world now showing that it's less stressful. Those calves walk less, looks like they, looks like they handle the weaning procedure easier. We don't have a lot of data though to say, hey, they're healthier in the feedlot once they get there if they've gone through that method. And it may be, no matter how you wean them, you still got to separate those events to make a difference in the health, health aspect. Because it's probably still a stressor, it's maybe just not quite as bad a stressor. So there's one aspect where we don't have a lot of data. That's a tough trial to do, right? Try to figure out how to do that trial. You've got to get a whole bunch of cow calf herds and split them and half of them weaned one way, half the way the other way, and then get a feedlot to buy all those cattle. That, that's a really tough trial, right? It's not easy to do. Joe's been trying for a while to figure that out. And it's, it's a tough project to, to accomplish. We're doing a, uh, uh, a project right now at WCVM, and uh, we're following a bunch of cow calf herds across Western Canada. Maybe some of you in the room are involved in this project, and you're sick of our surveys already, but we're surveying producers, and we're collecting samples from those farms. So we've got just over 100 farms from across three prairie provinces, and they're sort of selected geographically. And uh, one of the graduate students that's working on that project has asked a bunch of things about weaning and castration and dehorning. And uh, those producers, the ones that responded to that survey, this is sort of the percentage that we get for that. So 72% are abrupt weaning. Uh, doesn't mean they're necessarily going directly to the auction market, but they're, they're not using any, any other method than just completely separating the cow and calf all at once. Uh, there's about 20% using fence line. 2% uh, using two-stage, and there's 6% using a combination. Might, that, that 6 or 7% might be doing two-stage or something else or some combination of things. So it uh, looks like most producers are, are still doing that uh, to some extent. Uh, and I think I got some other data a little bit later on that talks about what percentage from the Western Canadian Cow-Calf Survey, what percentage are sending directly to the auction market right at weaning time as well. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work on castration and dehorning and looking at that, and Reynolds talked about that a lot today, so I don't need to spend much time on this. But we know that if you delay castration and dehorning, it's repeatedly found to dramatically reduce average daily gain and feed efficiency in the feedlot. It has a huge impact on the feedlot. has a relatively small impact on the small calf. We've talked about that already, how, what a big difference it is. The or the risk, risk of castration at the, uh, at the feedlot are far, far worse. They're far more likely to get, uh, get uh, post-castration infections and all sorts of other things. They can die from sort of post-castration complications when you're castrating big animals. That rarely, rarely happens in young animals. So, and we know that it causes this potential immunosuppression, increased risk to BRD, uh, and uh, Wayne Martin, one of, one of my supervisors at Guelph, uh, he found an increased risk of BRD in Ontario feedlots when greater than 30% of the calves were dehorned. Most of the feedlots that I know don't bother dehorning anymore because they know it's not worth it. It sets them back too much. It makes them more likely to be sick. It just is not happening at the feedlots. And, below, and then as Reynolds talked about, the beef coat of practice is saying get it done early. The good news there, this is from our same producer survey. Um, this is 51% uh, of the producers in our survey we're castrating uh, at less than a week of age, and 44% were at a week to three months. So it looks like the vast majority of our producers are doing the job early. So I think we're getting there. I'm sure if you talk to some of the feedlot people in the audience, they are still sick of belly bulls and all sorts of other things. But I think it's a lot better than it was probably 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and we gotta keep, gotta keep hammering that message that, that we need to castrate those calves early. 
pulled cattle, we're getting more and more pulled cattle, less horned cattle, so we don't have to dehorn as much. Uh, and most of our common beef breeds have pulled lines available, which eliminates the need for dehorning. Uh, the last beef quality audit showed that, that, that the cattle going through the slaughter plant, 87.5% of the fed cattle were pulled and 89% of the non-fed cattle were pulled. And, and Reynolds show you, showed you some data similar to that uh, earlier today. So I want to spend uh, a little bit more time on immunity in BRD, and this is a complicated subject, uh, and I have 10 minutes. So it'll be tough to, uh, tough to cover it all in one, one thing. One of the reasons it's complicated is there's all this huge list of pathogens that we're talking about with respiratory disease. It's not one bug, it's five or six different viruses, four or five different bacteria at least, and there's probably a bunch that we don't even know about that aren't listed there. So there's this huge list of pathogens, both viruses and bacteria uh, that are out there. And there's, the evidence is a little bit mixed, actually. So you would think that pre-vaccinating the calf would make sense. Remember I said, when does the disease happen? First two weeks in the feeding period. Anybody know how long it takes a vaccine to work? If you're going to travel to Africa and you need your yellow fever, how far ahead do you have to go get your vaccine? A month, probably, right? Two weeks at least, right? So it takes two weeks to a month to develop an immune response. You think vaccinated them the day they come into the feedlot is going to help very much? Eh, probably not, especially if they've never seen the vaccine before. So biologically, it makes a lot of sense. We should vaccinate these calves ahead of time. But when we do the trials, that eh, it doesn't always pan out. And it's probably because vaccines aren't perfect. They don't pr protect against everything. They don't protect against all the bugs. Uh, immunity can still be overwhelmed with some of the other risk factors. So it's not a perfect solution. If I buy pre-vaccinated calves, they're, I'm still probably going to have some get sick. right? I'm still probably going to have to treat calves. But I, on average, I'll probably have to treat less. And in most of the studies, it would show that there's a benefit of pre-weaning vaccinations three to four weeks prior to weaning, and that's often a recommendation as part of a preconditioning program. It lets the calf mount that immune response prior to the stress of weaning, and then also if it gets revaccinated at the time of weaning, when it comes to the feedlot, it has a much more rapid immune response and a secondary response to give it even more protection. And there's some da data that would show that even if we vaccinate those calves at two to three months of age, so when we're turning them out to pasture at branding or processing, that we'll still get that sort of memory response when we revaccinate them in the feedlot. So, so there's even a benefit, even if we don't do it, you know, three to four weeks before weaning, if we do it way back as a two to three month old calf, we can still get some of that benefit. Texas Ranch to Rail program showed that calves that received two doses of modified live vaccine at least nine weeks before weaning had the lowest morbidity and mortality compared to their other immunization programs. And there was another study showed that even if the first vaccination is given at that second month of age and the second vaccine is given three weeks before weaning, the outcomes were still just as favorable. So there's some evidence. It's not perfect, uh, but it makes sense biologically and, and it, would, it, would, it would make sense in most cases. The trouble again, is how does the cow-calf producer get paid for doing that and going to provide potentially a benefit to the feedlot producer? We still come back to that over and over again. There's lots of seroepidemiological studies and I'm going to skip over those. Basically what they do is they bleed the cattle on arrival, they bleed them 30 days later and they say, oh, what viruses did you get exposed to, right? And what made, what's makes you more likely to get sick? And they can also look at their titers when they came in and said, oh, if you had a high titered IBR, you're less likely to get sick. So there's tons and tons, there's, there's 30 trials like that out there that tell you, yeah, yeah, if you vaccinate them ahead of time and they have a titer before they get into the feedlot for, to most of these viruses, they're less likely to get sick. Or if they have a low titer when they come in and they seroconvert after they're in the feedlot, they're more likely to get sick. So there's tons of those and, and we could talk about those all day. The one I want to talk about in particular is BVD. And the reason I want to talk about a BVD, it's the only one that's the win-win, okay? It wins for everybody. And BVD is a, a unique virus. It actually, when it infects the cow, it infects a pregnant cow, it goes to the fetus. And the timing of the infection determines what happens. And I've talked about this many times at many different meetings, but if you get a pregnant cow, she's never been vaccinated, never been exposed, she becomes infected with the virus, 
She might get diarrhea for a day or two, but she's probably fine, but the virus infects her fetus. And depending on where she is in the stage of gestation, different things can happen. We can get early embryonic death, we can get abortion, we can get congenital defects, or we can get persistent infections. All right? So a lot of these, they're bad for the cow-calf person. Embryonic death, abortion, all those things, that's bad news. And I've seen lots of herds with major problems because they didn't vaccinate for BVD. So here we have a cow, we have this calf that's zero to 120 days in her belly. That tends to be where the immune system is developing and the immune system is looking around going, okay, there's my liver. I never want to attack my liver. There's my heart. Never want to attack my heart. There's my red blood cells. I never want to attack my red blood cells, right? It would be bad if your immune system starts attacking you. Those are called autoimmune diseases and they're really nasty. So the fetal immune system is starting to recognize itself and it sees BVD virus there and goes, oh, that must be part of me too. I'm never going to attack that. So they're born a walking, talking little virus factory. And they send virus out every orifice of their body, everywhere they go, and they may look completely normal. They might look ugly and stunted, but they might look completely normal, and you can't tell them apart. Out here, abortion stillbirths greater than 180 days, usually they just amount an immune response. So, talked about this, these PI calves, or persistently infected calves, or immunotolerant calves, they excrete huge quantities of virus, and they're the source of BVD outbreaks. They don't recognize the virus as foreign and their major source of the virus. Well, again, there's tons of studies that show that if you're in the same pen as a PI, you become more likely to get sick because this virus is a terribly immunosuppressive virus. So now if I have a PI in the same truck as me or in the same pen as me and it's shedding virus everywhere out of every orifice, it actually makes me sick temporarily, probably not terribly bad, but it, suck, it hits my immune system so bad that now I get sick from other infections and I, and I get respiratory disease and perhaps die from that. So PIs are the one win-win one, one situation where it makes no sense whatsoever not to have every cow in the country vaccinated appropriately for BVD. It makes no sense. It's a win for the feedlot people. It's a win for the cow-calf people. I've talked about it. For the last 25 years in, at the vet college to producer meetings and stuff, this is probably not the room I need to be talking to it because probably most of you are doing it, but there's still lots of herds out there that aren't vaccinating their cows. Uh, lots of other studies there, I'll skip over those, but the best way to ensure that fetus is protected is by vaccinating the cow with a modified live vaccine pre-breeding. So you're actually vaccinating the cow so that you don't create these PI calves that then go into the feedlot and wreak havoc. So it's a complicated disease. Last thing I want to talk about is preconditioning. It's an old concept that was developed way back in the 60s. John Herrick from Iowa State University was the veterinarian supposed to, who had brought it out. And it was basically marketing a calf that was vaccinated, castrated, dehorned, dewormed, weaned, and trained to eat from a bunk and drink from a water tank. And over the 70s and 80s, and those of you with some gray in your hair probably remember the green tag sale here in Saskatchewan and, and uh, various uh, preconditioning programs all across North America. There was tons of them, tons of them. It, we all said, oh yeah, that's what we should be doing. But the biggest issue was how does the cow-calf producer get value? Are there enough calves there for a big feedlot to even worry about it? You know, what do they want to pay and still make money, et cetera, et cetera. It became down to an economic argument. Certainly as the numbers of preconditioned or pre-vaccinated calves increase, the value of those calves increase, uh, but it still becomes an economic challenge, not really a biological question about how to make those things work. There's lots of studies on them. Many of them are old. Most of them show a benefit for preconditioning. It's not perfect. Right? Buying preconditioned calves does not mean you won't have a wreck. Right? You can still have a wreck with preconditioned calves. It's just probably they happen less often right? in the long run and you probably end up treating less cattle overall. Uh, usually show higher average daily gain, improved feed to gain, a bunch of other things like that. There's a great uh, website, Canfax has it, on, on economic considerations on preconditioning calves. So if you're a cow-calf producer and you want to think about that, it probably gets into William's niche markets and things like that in a little way, uh, but certainly it's one of those things. In the Western Canadian uh, cow-calf survey that WBDC did, only 9% of producers were preconditioning. 72% of producers sold their calves directly at weaning. This is probably, I think, 
the next animal welfare issue in our industry. I think it's a ways away. Don't worry about it tomorrow. But, you know, two codes of practice from now, we're going to be talking about this, right? And, and we might talk about it sooner if we get limited on how we can use our antimicrobials uh, in the feedlot in the, in the next little while. Uh, it's, it's not an easy solution because we have some huge economic challenges and we have this segmented industry that doesn't always get along with each other terribly well. Uh, and there are challenges with sort of showing value for, for doing things the right way and then having enough of those producers doing it the right way so that a large feedlot could buy enough calves to fill, fill pens that way if they, if they chose to. Um, so, so there's some huge challenges to it. It's, it's an old, old research. We don't have a lot of current research. It's maybe something we need to start looking at again here and, and, and putting some new stuff on and a new twist on it in the next few years. So that's all I got, Nathan. I'm happy to take any questions if you have some. I just sort of wondered, Thomas Mould, and I noticed my calves, there's four or six of them will club up and they'll stay and they don't integrate until they're two months, they, they just stay separate. And then I see them, they'll start, the mothers will kick them off and they'll, 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 they're on silage, they're on hay, whatever. And they'll put a little bit of time in. And then they'll go to the auction mat, they get trucked, they get sod all to eat. The place is as you see it because of the conditions that people operate on, that isn't the auction mat's fault, it's the fact that how on earth do they actually create that environment that cows first to come together to be anything like the environment they enjoyed out on the farm. Then you've got the scene whereby how many people with a you know, wooden uh, feedlot would think of having a decent fire once every couple of years and sterilizing the whole place? Not many. Yeah. And is there not a severe risk from the existing bugs that are in those feedlots when the calves go in, when they're in the auction mart? And they sure as hell weren't dying on the farm or else they wouldn't have made it there. Yeah. No, good question. I you know, there's been a little bit of research looking at environmental contamination of organisms in feedlots, but uh, it doesn't look like that's a really important factor for most of this. It might be for parasites and things like that, but, you know, we, we can deworm cattle fairly efficiently at feedlots and, and go into them. So it doesn't look like, an, you know, it looks like it's animal to animal contact. So it's probably the mixing and, and the contact that happens at the auction market and then the mixing that happens in the feedlot. Uh, you know, quick story. One year, Dr. McKinnon and I were doing a project at the university feedlot. We have, a, we have small pens, right? We have a small pen feedlot. We don't get very many sick animals because we've got small pens, right? And it's a small feedlot. That takes away one of the big risk factors. There's not a lot of mixing for small pens. Well, for one reason or other, we said, well, for this project, we're going to start this way, and then we're going to mix the pens up, and then we're going to mix the pens up again, and then we're going to mix the pen. We treated cattle galore that year just because we kept sort of mixing these small pens around and re-randomizing the animals to different pens, et cetera, et cetera. So it shows you that it's probably more an animal contact thing than it is actually pen contamination. It's impossible to, to, uh, to sterilize an outdoor environment, okay? And bottom line, whether it's your cow-calf operation or a feedlot, you cannot disinfect enough to clean bugs off. So thank goodness environmental contamination isn't a big thing because it would be impossible to completely clean. We've had some salmonella outbreaks in some feedlots. That's a little different story. You know, we've got to do some sanitation then in our handling facilities and things like that. But that's a, that's a little different, different ball of wax. Uh, 